Does that look all right? Cute or anything or no? It's adorable. Who was that? Oh, that was Coach Lombardi. The Coach Lombardi? <laughs> Jesus. Yes. I said, well, tell him two times I'm sorry. No, no, no. Tell him now. Tell him I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so he says, Coach uh, Marv, say you're sorry. He said, well, tell Marv we're going to draft him now in the 12th round. And so that was probably one of the best things in my life, to go and be with a team like that and be with a leader like Coach Lombardi. Um, I, I, I learned to be a man. I learned responsibilities. I learned how to treat people. Mm -hmm. I learned the harder you work, the luckier you get. And, and, and there's so many great things that has happened in my life. And, and I think I'm, I know I'm one of the most fortunate football players. But here's a man coming up after me. This guy, you know, the Green Bay Packers drafted him. And they drafted him as tight end. Now, that's, that's a position I play. <laughs> His name is Dave Robinson. And for some reason, I, I, I knew everything about Mr. Robinson. I knew his, his, his direction he would go during the night, direction he'd go during the day. He was, he was all American this, all American that. Everybody loved him. But nobody knew who I was. Now, Dave was a tight end. And the Green Bay Packers drafted him as a tight end. And so I knew I had my work out for me. So now I'm going to introduce you to the guy who gave me, who let me have the tight end position because he was such a good athlete. Mr. Robinson, are you there? I'm here, Marv. How you doing? You know, Marv was right in the way, you know, but what we forgot to tell you was in those days, all players played both ways. You had to go offense and defense. You had one between football. You couldn't, you didn't have this mass when it changed balls. You had, didn't have another team to run the field. So I played offensive and defensive end. He's correct. And it was kind of an interesting situation because uh, I don't know how much you know about Dave Robinson, but I didn't even know who Mar Fleming was. <laughs> and I met him, I met him after I, I was a, uh, I, had, I, I didn't study your draft picks that much because I, I was, um, I knew I was drafted in the first round, but I was the first African-American or, or black ball player to play in the Gator Bowl. And our team played in the Gator Bowl. And so I had a lot of uh, pressure, social pressure on me and whatnot, to, not just to, to be there, but to, to actually show out. And I had to study. I was, I was more prepared for that game than any other game because I knew that they were going to be, the, all eyes were going to be on me. And, uh, when the game was over, I had a great feel of relief that I got on the, ball, on the plane. This is my senior year. And I, as an MVP of the game for the loop we lost, though, and MVP, and uh, going to Hawaii, and on the plane to Hawaii, I heard this voice in the back. I said, who is that? And it was Bar Fleming who was, I was up fr front talking because I was wide awake. He had just got done playing the East-West game. And he came up, and that's how I met Bar Fleming. He came and he said, who are you? And I said, I'm Dave Robinson. He said, D. Dave Robinson? <laughs> yeah. No. He said, I'm going to get your job. I said, hey. it's, 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 it's open. It's open casting. Anybody can get it. All you got to do is block and tackle better. And then he went back in the back of the plane, and that was it. And then we, we went to the Hula Bowl, and he was on, he played on, he was tight end on one team, and I was tight end on the other team. We had, a, we had an interesting situation. But something that Bob said to him, I played against Bob every day in practice just about when the, we, we had a the nutcracker, and we were going on. And they had me up against the other tight end and whatnot. And these tight ends coming, I was having a good time. And then Lombardi looked at and sees what I'm, and he looks at sees what Marvin. He said, "Hey, get up there, Robinson, get up there." He, and we went at it the very first day, right that bar. And then every time he had the nutcracker drill, he insisted on Marvin and I going at it a couple of times, and he just sat back and smiled. That's all. We and we hit each other, and and it's something strange about football that I, not strange. It's, it's very I can understand it. We hit our friends harder than we do the guys you don't like. Because I never want you, you know, I never want a mob to go back and say, Dave's getting soft. I want to say, man, he still hits hard. And Marv hit me this, and he did the same thing to me. And you, you can hear the pads clash. And Vince, every time he hit, Vince just said that and smile. He loved that contact. He's old school. But uh, it was interesting. And I played for two teams. On, everybody's played for two teams. And, and my, I played for Green Bay and then the Washington Redskins. 
Uh, and I played with Vince Lombardi and George Allen, two great coaches. It's a, it's a, it, I got a chance to, to uh, compare them. But one last thing I say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm running off too much of the mouth. I tell people, when I was in high school, I had a great high school coach. But I knew when I went to college, I'd have better coaching. I went to college, I played for Penn State, Rip Bang on Joe Paterno, and, and uh, it was great coaching. I knew when I went from, from there to the pros, I was gonna have better coaching. I went there with Phil Bankson and Vince Lombardi, and they were much better coaches. I never knew how good and how great it was to be in Green Bay with Vince Lombardi until I played for other coaches. And, and in comparison, they all fell short. Vince Lombardi was the man, the coach of the year and of the ages. You know, um, David. Yes, sir. One thing about Lombardi was um, Lombardi was a coach of, to me, a coach of life. Right. He was a coach of life, and I, I yeah. live my life like it is now. But the real reason why we're here, let me tell you, is because of this man next to me. Right. It wasn't for Uncle Bob to come up with this idea to do something to help players like ourselves help the, the pioneer players. I mean, uh, he's done wonders. I, would, I wouldn't say the bullet, but I, I would shield him for a minute. <laughs> so, I, I love this guy. We, we think the same. And he has uh, the same thoughts in mind about helping people like I do. So go ahead and tell them why we started this, Mr. Grant. Mar Mar Marvin, is it OK? If I tell one very quick story before, Please, before I do you that, have since, all the time. The, since Dave oh, mentioned world. the Gator Bowl, um, you know, as I was saying, that when um, you know, myself and the other three players integrated the college sport in the South, it, it was a kind of different time. And uh, there were the death threats every week uh, when you traveled. And uh, these were threats that were being made by the Klan and other people who had already demonstrated that they were willing and capable of following through uh, on their threats. James Meredith had just gotten in as, as a regular student down at Ole Miss, and they had to have the uh, National Guard or the Army escort him back and forth to class every day. So here we are at Wake Forest, and you got to remember, this was the 60s, and the Civil Rights Movement was going on in the groups they just started. The Panthers were breaking out. Core was breaking out. Uh, the Student Nonviolent uh, you know, Committee, the NAACP, everything. You know, as black <clears throat> folks, you know, we were trying to get some space. We were trying. We were looking for a little better life, like a beer. And so uh, the, here we go. <clears throat> the first game, I'm going down to Clemson University to play. Yes, that same Clemson that they, when you see them play like you're today, they're always number one or two in the nation, and at least 95% of their players are black. Well, at that time, there were no black players like you're there or anywhere else in the South. So we showed up down at Lake Clemson. We got onto the field, myself and my two roommates, Butch Henry and, uh, and uh, uh, William Smith. So we walk out onto the field. We get out there, and... Uh, now we've got about 35, 40,000 people at the stands, and uh, they were all white, all of them, every single one of them. And uh, we go out, and we're kind of warming up, and we're looking around, and we had gotten the death threats all week long with letters and calls into the uh, payphone in our dorm that coaches had been threatening and everything. So we go out onto the field, and you're really tight, because you're wondering, uh, well, are they really going to do it? So that first game, we went out on the field there. I looked all the way down the field, and there were groundskeepers that were raking the grass, and, you know, needing, making the field neat and everything there. Obviously, at that time, they were all black. So I looked down and I killed the field, and there was one you know, older gentleman down there, he was probably, at that time, the age that I am now. And you got to remember, it was the 60s. What he did was he raised, for those of you who remember, he raised the black power sign, but he only raised it about that high. He didn't put it up there 
where he, he just raised it about that high, and I kind of looked around the stadium to see if anyone like you saw it, and I gave it back to him. But guess what? I only raised mine about that high, too. <laughs> I was about to stick it up that you're there. The retired uh, players thank your Congress. Um, a few years back, uh, a group of us, uh, Dave, Mark, uh, Woody Campbell, Bernie Parrish, a lot of us guys who would be considered old timers. The uh, man who uh, established and founded the pension for us as retired players, Billy Houghton, a good friend. And um, we had been begging the owners to do more for us, do this for us for years. When we couldn't get it through, like you're begging, then we would rely on lawsuits. And just the same as it is today, the lawyers would always end up with all the money. Even if, even if we won, we wouldn't end up with all the money. So we started to think, this is not working for us. I started to look and investigate, and what I discovered was the NFL owners were really doing more for us than they were legally required to do for us. Looks like Marv dumped out us on us there. <laughs> I know. What, what, what's he doing to us, Dave? Now it's just you and I. I well, I know this. It's, I, I know. I was going to elaborate a little bit on what, what Bob was saying. You know, I went very similar situation. You know, even though I went to Penn State, it was far from being the first African American to go to Penn State. They had quite a few at the Penn State, but you still had that had the same problem when you went south. When we went south to play, I. Had, it was something awesome. It, it, you were, had death threats. Uh, in fact, being the, the first black in the Gator Bowl, uh, I had been hurt that year with a, a dislocated shoulder and separated shoulder and a dislocated clavicle. And they came to me before the game and they said, Dave, while you were out injured, we had a senior, Jim Swab, who played very well. And uh, so we're going to reward him, let him start the game. However, after the first series, you can go in and play, and play with the starters. And uh, I said, fine. I was upset because I told a bunch of girls, I said, when they introduce you on national TV, I'm going to wave at you. So, <laughs> so I couldn't do that, including my, including my wife, who determined to be my wife, my girlfriend then. But anyway, I uh, didn't go. But then after the game, they brought me my mail. They had been sent for my mail. And the guy said he was a retired military man, qualified expert with a rifle, who wanted to take his gun to the game. When he introduced me on CBS, I ran on the field. She said, I'm going to shoot that black bear right on the 50 yard line. <laughs> that really, that really, that really upset me. Because I can't stand bears. But anyway, I don't know why he called me a bear, but that was it. It was a, it was a, it was a hard time to play. And, uh, and it, it, some, that didn't happen that way every time, but something happened every time the team went south. Maybe we went south to play in West Virginia or anywhere else. Now, Dave, do me a favor. You know, yes, while we're waiting for uh, Marv and Bob to jump back in, hopefully they'll be able to in just a minute here. Maybe they had an internet failure or something like that. But tell me, how did you get involved with retired players uh, Congress? Congress? Well, I always known about the Congress, and the thing is, there's a lot of different groups of NFL alumni, NFL this and NFL that, and the Professional Football Retired Players Association, all these things. None of them were, were actually working organizations that work that, that would add a product to sell to help help the to help the players help themselves. See, the players don't want a handout. We would like to work and do ourselves. So this 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 thing hit me right on the head. Mark Fleming was a catalyst. Mark Fleming one that got me and Bob Bob and I together, and uh, Mark did it. And, and what this these jackets and the the, the jackets we're doing right now. And they're doing other items also in the future. The plans are big plans. But we started with these jackets. And the big thing on these, this is a, a, something that the NFL retired players can do to help themselves. We're not going to get pensions increases from the, from the owners or from the league. We, we might, but we don't expect it. We're saying that sort of like that old song that, that James Brown said, open the door and I'm going to get it myself. That's the whole thing. <laughs> and that, that's, a, that's how we feel about it. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me, and from uh, and uh, when Marvin told me about it, I said, Marvin, count me in. I'm in. I'm, I'm in. I want to do this. Well, I, I think people would be amazed, and you'd probably agree with me. The 
uh, the older players in their 80s and 90s that are still around with us, the pension that they get these days, I've heard stories that uh, some of them get as little as $1,000 a year. And so Good. tell me if I'm wrong in regards to okay. that. Okay. You have to understand the pension. The pension plan started in 1959, and you had to play five years under the pension plan to be vested. And they said that, that they said that uh, you're going to get, uh, for each of those five years, I think they, they told us we get $100 or something, so you need $500 a month. And, and pension. But then the way it was set up, they had to play all five years. You had to play 59, 60, 1, 2, and 3. Those five, those particular years. If you played 20 years and retired in 1962, you got a goose egg. You got nothing. You had to play 63. So what that, what that did, a lot of ball players stayed around. And then, and so then, and rightfully so, they, went, they realized they had made a mistake. They went back and picked up those guys who had qualified but played prior to 1959. They called a pre-59, and they brought him into the plan, but they didn't give a contribution to go along with it. As the end result, if I had only played those first five years, it would have been thirty dollars per month per year. In other words, I would have paid for one hundred and fifty dollars a month. And as you can do the math real quick, that's eighteen hundred dollars a year. Wow, wow. That was it. But but uh, but now the last year I played, they they it was two hundred eighty dollars for that year. So to find out what a guy makes, you can't just say how many years he played. you got to say which years and then add up the numbers associated with those years, and that's his pension. It's a bad way to do a pension, but that's better than nothing. We, we're happy to get it. Hey, Dave, look, look who d decided to join us again here. <laughs> the, uh, hey, hey, there they are. Okay. You know, one of our plugs came out you know, over here. Uh, I can pick up where I left off. What was the last thing that I said? You, you just started to Dave talk Robinson about the, the – well, Dave Robinson being a great guy, like he just said, <laughs> but the, the Congress, Players Congress, he started to describe it a little bit and, and everything. And, and Dave kind of filled in a little bit while you guys uh, had a coffee break. But if you could just kind of, you know, jump back in, Bob, and explain, that would be great. Okay. Uh, and, and I'll take the short – you know, give you the short version here like you now. You know, we have been begging the owners to do more for us here, do more for us like you're there. And they were really not legally required, not legally required to do anything uh, more for us than they were doing. Actually, as I heard Dave mention some of the like of the numbers, they really didn't have to do that. You know, my good friend and mentor, Bill Houghton, uh, who lives in Spain uh, now, is the father of the pension. He and uh, Creighton Miller and some of the other ones forced the league's hand and got them to give us the little pension that Dave was mentioning, like you're to you. But obviously it was not you know, enough, like you're there. Over the years, they increased that, like you're somewhat, but it still wasn't like you're enough. With us as retired players, about the only way that we were going to get like you're more, we thought was through lawsuits. And in the lawsuits, the lawyers, Win or lose, always end up with all of the money, or by begging. And people get tired of you, like you're begging and coming back to them time and time again. They just get like you're tired of it. So after meeting with uh, some people who, you know, used to be adversaries, but they ended up being friends, Joe Brown and Harold Anderson, at the NFL, I start to discuss with them and uh, the, the, the problem myself and Bernie Parrish, and I asked them, what, what, what do we have to do to get a piece of the game to improve our lives and everything? They said, you guys should go into business for yourself. So what do you mean go into business for yourself? They said, you guys should incorporate that yourself and start doing business for yourself. So we went right on and we did like your that. Going to retired NFL players, thank your Congress. You know, some years, thank your back. Uh, we held a few national conventions and everything. And then I went back to them and I said, you know what? Uh, we would like to sit down with you guys and uh, we have a business proposition. They said, what? You're coming back to us? We says, yeah, absolutely. He said, well, what, well what, do you, what do you want? I says, we want to manufacture and sell NFL team jackets. They says, you don't know anything about that. You can't sell jackets off a truck. And you got to put up money for a license and stuff. And you need a manufacturing partner. I had already established that we had a manufacturing partner, JH Design, um, here in Los Angeles, California, JH Design. 
is the largest manufacturer of sports jackets outside of Lake China. At our manufacturing facility here, we import and we make jackets here, like the jackets that you see Marvin and I wearing uh, here, here today. We make our own Lake here. If you see, oh, and that's when the gyms got there too. You know, if you see these jackets like on the street, chances are, oh, about 80% that we made or imported these jackets, regardless of whose label you see in the back there. So we went into this with you know, the NFL. They gave us the license. We have done very well you know, there. We've developed a really, really good like your following. For us to do the things that we really want to do, not just for our players. And when we make money, let me tell you this. Um, the way that we look at it was when we ever we we're able to put a few nickels and dimes into a player's pocket. If we're able to help subsidize his pension a little bit or his family, he doesn't take that money home and sew it up in a mattress. He spends that money in the community that he lives in. He tithes at the church. He gives to charities in his communities. He shops at a local grocery store in the community that he lives in or his family lives like you, and that pays a cashier and other people. So when we generate money, we're helping retired like your players by selling the jackets, manufacturing and selling all these wonderful jackets. As we do manufacture most of the jackets for Major League Baseball, the NBA, and professional hockey as they go well. We are not just working to help like your players and our players who are in the twilight years of their lives, many of who can use your help and are too just proud to beg anymore to ask like you for it. Um, we are looking to help the communities that we live in like you too. Charitably, we give a lot. We give scholarships. We, I just think just a couple of weeks ago, like you Marv, we, uh, with one of the flight schools here in Los Angeles, we met with them and we're going to give scholarships to little kids from the inner city. We're going to get them into their flight program there, whereas eventually they can get their license. That's at the Compton Airport. And they have already turned out a number of the young people who are flying commercially. They're there. So we are trying to help not just players, but the communities <clears throat> that we live in. The only way that we can really maximize this situation is through corporate participation, supporting us in what we're doing, with people like Jim who are helping us to get exposure, and most of all, with you as a fan. Our jackets are good quality. They are attractive. You know you love that green and gold. <laughs> oh, let me let me tell you. Tell tell the audience what a feeling you get when you when you give money to these guys. I mean, it makes you almost want to cry because it's almost like they, you know, they don't expect it. Oh my! Yeah. Oh my goodness! We have we, we have. Uh, the oldest member of our board of directors is Curly Morrison, who is 95 years old now. And um, we give them a free grant, no questions asked, every year. All they got to do is just call in and say, yeah, yo, yo, give, me, yo, give me my grant. Give me some money. It'll help out. They can spend it on whatever they want to. Their great-granddaughter that's in, uh, that's in uh, college or whatever they want like, yo, to do. If there's something that they need, they can use it for something that they need. But when we went down to give Curly Morrison, and Curly played for the Cleveland Browns back in the 50s. Curly was the fullback sandwiched in between Myron Motley and Jim Brown. Wonderful, wonderful man. Curly also founded the Legends Golf Tournament up in Pebble Beach, California, giving man all of his you know, life there. So we went down, and we have some tape on our website of it somewhere. Myself and a few of the other directors went down to deliver Curly's, you know, check to him, and he started talking, and we started talking. He was so grateful. We we all ended up crying, all of us, like you did, because it was an opportunity for us to help you know, our own, to help one of our own who has done so much in the community that he lived in, where it was up in Carmel, California, when he was there, or down at Murrieta, California, to make your California with his being there now. We have guys like this all around, like you, the country. And uh, with, the fan, with you fans, 
uh, by supporting us. And thank you, Jim, uh, with this kind of like your support. We're going to do much, much more than we've done like you already. And with the Packers being, I got to tell you, I, I played for the Colts, but I really am a Packer fan because Mark Murphy, president of the Packers, very good. was one of the very first people from ownership to step forward and encourage us to do what we're doing for all players and do the work that we're doing in our communities. And Mark didn't, Mark didn't just say that he'll do it. Mark put money behind his words. It was to help us get started. So you know, I am you know, most certainly uh, you know, not just a friend and fan and brother of Dave and Marv and a lot of other like you guys. I'm a Green Bay Packer fan. <clears throat> we, we, Bob, I, I got to jump in here real quick. And I want to, if it's okay, I just want to share my screen and show everybody out there the website and even show them where they could go watch the video of you guys presenting that check to, to Curly. But deep down inside, we know that you wanted to be a Packer. We know it deep down inside <laughs> already. And we know that you're a cheesehead by heart. I am. Uh, All right. All right. There, I mean, there's no need. <clears throat> oh, did that? Oh, you got me there. I'm still on here. No, there's no need. Man, I, I, I root. I, I root for the Packers every single week. What? I just wanted to show the website real quick to everybody, and we're going to talk a little bit about it more in just a few minutes here. But if you guys go to playerscongress.com, you could read it yourself you could see pictures of Marv and Dave there and other uh you know NFL players I believe Rosie Greer uh if I, I could be wrong in regards to that but there's many NFL players because I know that a lot of us Packer hey, fans Gino have Marchetti. you got another code over there Jim don't forget what? the great captain Gino Marchetti that's right that's right but we have a lot of Packer fans that have family members of those other uh, lousy teams out there, you know, the Bears and that kind of stuff. And so we got we got to represent those people and keep them warm as well. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And I will tell everybody that uh, Mr. Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys just came on board with us uh, last about two weeks, like you'll go. And we're working the details out there. So uh, <clears throat> let's not hate those cowboys. Let's hope that they can. <laughs> now, now, Marv, where are we at? Are we going to have Craig come in and talk a little bit about the jackets now? Where are we at in this process? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, me kicking um, his butt. <laughs> every game I played. I held him every play. He never even got off the line. I don't think he ever, I don't think he ever caught a pass when he played. I held him on every Lake Hill line, especially when it was in Lake Hill, Baltimore, because no, 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 no. they never threw. They never threw a flag in Baltimore. No, I had my best games in Baltimore. <laughs> I did. Uh, um, would, would you, uh, uh, Robbie, would you uh, – Verify that, please. I had my best games. I wanted to be better. Marvin than... would not lie. <laughs> Marvin, says, Marvin says it's got to be true. No, I know. I... Hey, Marv, I know for a fact I had my best game in Baltimore. One of my best games. In well, fact, I... if you go back and check the record books, I own the longest interception in Baltimore Colt history. Well, 87 yards in Memorial Stadium. And he tore the stadium down so nobody can break that record. <laughs> well, I'm not even going to argue with you, you guys because I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you, we hated playing. We hated to have to play. You, you did everything right. All of you were in shape. I mean, all of you were just, you know, terrific, terrific competitors. And uh, we, uh, I think we beat you on a Monday night game one time somewhere, something like you know, that. But, uh, Nobody, nobody ran rough shot over like the Packers. And you guys weren't even like your dirty the way that the Bears were. <laughs> That's right. You know, that correct? One thing you said, though, Bob, uh, Mark Murphy is the CEO of the Packers, no higher than the president. And, and, he, and he is a former uh, defensive back in the National Football League, able to watch the Redskins, uh, Al Colgate. And he understands some of the plight of the ball players. He knows this was going on. So that's that's why he's that way. But uh that's one of the reasons. But it's a 
we, we have put together, uh, you have put together rather, a, a one organization that lets the ball player stand up and do something for himself. He gives you some pride, and he, when he gets that check, no matter how big it is, he can say, I earned this. This was not a gift. This is not something I forced somebody to give me. I earned every penny here. And that's why, we, that's why it's so important that, to me that we, that we uh, sell these jackets because it's going to help. If we don't sell jackets, the whole organization crumbles, you know. <laughs> the shop shows that. Plus, David, but David, I, like I, my, I like to sign my name inside those jackets. David, I want to say that I had one, I guess, um, motivation when I played the, uh, the Colts. That? Better than John Mackey. <laughs> John Mackey was probably uh, one of the best tight ends ever, really. He could run. Uh, he could block a little bit. But he can he can catch that ball. I mean, he yeah. was big, big, big. At one time, John I saw, Maggie, John Maggie started as a halfback, you know. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. At one time, you know, I said congratulations to, to getting into the you know Hall of Fame, and he says, "Well, um, thank you, Marv." He said, "You should be in too." I said, "Nah, they don't, I don't get the ball as much, you mm -hmm. know." But then I thought about that. I don't care about getting the ball. I didn't care about getting the ball. I knew that every time we ran a short yardage or a third and one, third and two, they're coming to the strong side. Even when I was with, with uh, the Dolphins, you know, I raised my hand. We're going over short yardage. That's says, coach, coach, coach. Yeah, Mark, he says. I said, um, what, um, what's this every time we you know, get third and long goal line? You know, on the third and short, you know, we go like we, we go to the strong side. He says, because we got you, Marv. <laughs> I, I said, Coach, I said, Coach, they're, they're reading our tendencies. He says, what? <laughs> 10 out of 10 is good. <laughs> you know, I couldn't argue with that. So my, my whole thing when playing football was when I walked off the field, I didn't care how many passes I caught. I wanted to have a W. That W, did we win? And that was my only, uh, that was my motivation. To win, play, play as best you can at whatever you can do. That was my motivation. And when I played against, when I played against the, the Colts, Mackey, God, he was so good. Yep. And so, man, go ahead. Man, you know, man. I'll tell you something interesting. I was going to cut you off, but we're talking about that hula bowl game. We played in a hula bowl game and Marv and I were in, the third tight end in that hula ball game was John Mackey. He was there also. <laughs> that was quite a quite a collection of ball players there at that hula ball. Yeah. It was a good game, and a game worth watching. Got you. Know, one of the things that all of us you know, you'll share, you guys really, and I and, and I'm going to mention my guy Bart Starr was a big supporter of our work over the years. Bart's not doing so well. Who's that? I never, Bart Starr. Bart Starr. Uh, I, never asked, I don't think I've ever heard of him. Oh, I uh, never asked Bart to help us out, whereas he didn't step forward and like you'll do it. But I have to mention our guy, you're not too, Johnny Unitas. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the quarterback after Otto Graham that took us into the modern era. One very quick you know, story, since you know, this is talk story, Hawaiian style kind, you know, on John Unitas, when you know, I was a rookie, we were on the plane, and I had, a, I had avoided eye contact with them all the way through training camp. Because back during that time, you know, those sharp eye quarterbacks like Unitas if they decided that they didn't want you there and you were a linebacker or defensive back, they could get you cut in one afternoon. They compete, com complete 50 passes in your, in your area. So I always avoided during training camp <clears throat> and early that first year making eye contact with him. It's like maybe he won't even notice something like you'll hear and he won't target me. But we're on the plane and we're going out to Oakland to uh, play, learn a tremendous like your lesson. And I, and I love being around men of character like Dave Robinson and Mark Fleming and having friends like Bart Starr like you too. We're on the plane. And we used to fly on the planes like you then. We'd have the entire plane for the team and uh, the, the sports writers that travel with us and everything, full-size planes. So here I am, I'm a rookie, and I'm coming down the aisle. And uh, 
I'm kind of like you're thinking, man, I was watching Johnny Unitas play back in 1958, 59 for the championships there and stuff like you're there. And I never said anything to him at training camp. I'm coming down the aisle and I took a deep breath and I, I stopped. And, and I says, Johnny, can I ask you a question? Yeah, you can, I, I was shocked and paralyzed when he says, uh, sure, sit down. We had enough seats on the plane, which everybody had three seats there. He said, sit down. I thought, oh my God, I, I didn't want to go this far with it. So I sat down and he says, you you you're what? And it came out all wrong. I, I'm telling you, I, you know, uh, I, I said, what's it feel like to be Johnny Unitas? And it was like, oh, no, I didn't mean it. That, I, he started laughing. He says, no, he says, uh, he says, I, I know what you meant, like your kid. He says, uh, that's just who I am on Sunday. He says, you know, during the week when I'm at home with my family and everybody that knows me, with my mom and dad, and he says, I'm just, you know, John Unitas. <clears throat> it's kind of like Clark Kent going into that <laughs> phone booth. <laughs> Coming out, he says, when I come out onto the field today, he says, I'm Johnny Unitas for everybody else. He said, but just call me John. That's who I am. I, it stuck with me. You know, that kind of character, uh, they stuck with me all the way like yo to like yo today. And, and I wish that some of the young guys who are playing today, you know, could meet, you know, some of our men of character from the past. Unfortunately, a lot of them have passed. You know, also, uh, Bob, and I, I thought I had a great deal of respect for Johnny Nass also because Johnny Nass and Bart Starr, to me, were the greatest two quarterbacks of the era. And one thing you got to remember, these guys had to call their own plays. When they walked on the field, they had to know what the down, the situation, position on the field, personnel, what the personnel who was in there and everything. And then they had to weigh all that, and they run through the playbook and come up with the right play. And invariably, those two guys called the right place. Um, I talked to one of our wide receivers, Boyd Dollar, who played every game at Vincent Boyd coached in Green Bay. And he said in nine years, he can't remember the coach sending in more than five plays. Bart Starr called all the rest himself. Now, even the great Otto Graham, who I rate as one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time because he played in 10 consecutive world championship games yes. and won seven of them. He, that's the greatest. And no quarterback could touch that. But and, – and, but, even he, Paul Brown, had running guards who brought the play in every play. He sent a guard, they changed guards. And uh, I think it was Ned and, uh, and uh, what's the Willie, uh, what's that kid? Uh, anyway, the, the two guards came in and out. Later on. Hmm? Gene Hickerson later on. No, Gene Hickerson was, Gene Hickerson was the right guard. He stayed there all the time. And, and the left guard was the running guard. They came, but he brought the plays in every, every play. Because, uh, you know, Mel Plummer, those guys, they didn't call the plays. And, and even the Otto Graham, but, but uh, Paul Brown wanted that, that kind of power. But these, these guys, were, it was just different. Everything was different. These guys had, this, had hours and hours and hours going over the defensive tendencies and everything else in order to call. And on defense, we had to know everything. We had to be able, we had to, know, be able to tell when Johnny Nice was going to go to the bathroom and which hand he was going to use to wipe himself. We had to know everything about the man because he, that's what we were going to stop him. And the big difference in Bart Starr and Johnny Nice was John had the big arm. John could go deep. And, and, and Bart Starr, he could go deep, but he didn't go deep very often because he didn't, he didn't feel comfortable. And, and Johnny loved to throw the bomb. That was, I tell you, but it was a, he was a hell of a man to play against. I tell you, the whole, the whole Baltimore Colts team, that Baltimore Colts team was our nemesis because we only had two divisions in the NFL then, East and West. And Baltimore was in the Western Division because when it came into the league, they were so close to Washington, D.C., that uh, the Washington, D.C. owner, uh, uh, George Preston Marshall, said that he did not want a team to play in Baltimore and Washington the same year because the people wouldn't pay to see him play both. They're only about, what, it's about 40, 50 miles apart, right? Yeah, less than that. Yeah, less than that. And he said the team, people come to see the guy play in Baltimore – he wouldn't have been able to sell the crowd out in Washington. So they put Baltimore in the Western Division. And that was some division. <laughs> we had Baltimore. We had, we had Detroit. And we had uh, Chicago. Oh, it's all the, we had some toughies in there. 
But Baltimore and Green Bay was something special. Every every bitch knew it was something special. And and you, you guys knew it was something special. We were always ready. I ne- I never get, and War Memorial Stadium was, to me, they can say all they want about, about Seattle. That was the loudest stadium <laughs> in the country. Man. The sound came right down. On, and it was something. And Vinny, Vinny did something. Remember Mark Vinny, he told us that one time, he said, you know, you're going to get a lot of boos at him when you're introduced. He said, they're booing you because they're afraid you're going to beat their Colts. If they thought the Colts had an easy game, they'd be cheering you when the Colts said, so those boos are really cheers. So, so, he said, so the more they boo, that means the more they're afraid you're going to whoop the Colts. <laughs> and then what he did, we stood in, we stood in, the, in the tunnel and waited until the Colts came on the field. Then Vincent, let's go. So we ran on the field at the same time, and the crowd didn't know what to do. They're going, boo, yeah, boo, 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 yeah, yeah. They couldn't they cheer or boo. And we just laughed all the way to the sideline. It was a game. It was a, they, were, they were real football games then. I tell you, I love them. David, you've had um, a lot of great moments, okay? Yes. Right. Uh, there to see. Hmm? When you're making the big play, making the big interception. What is, if you can think about, what is your greatest play that you, and you got to have one. I, I have well, one. I want to tell it. Mark, that yours, that one here. Mark, you got to say of which year, because there's big plays in every season. And yeah. that's like, uh, so the biggest one. The big, hmm? The biggest one. Mm? The biggest oh, I mean, the say, like that, that, the interception I told you about earlier against the Baltimore Colts. Yeah. To me, that was the highlight of that, of that game. For me. Yeah. Yeah. See, you know, we had to win that game in 1965. And we and we went and that that t- set up a touchdown. We won the game in Baltimore. Had we not won the game, it would not have been a playoff at the end of the season. Mm-hmm. With no playoff, then that 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 disputed field goal would never come down. The goal post would never been extended up to twenty feet and everything else. That was a big game. The next year we played in Washington. We played in Dallas, and and, and come down to the final fifty two seconds. They're on a two yard line. We've got a seven point lead. They're trying to score to tie or go ahead with a two point extra, and the and Don Meredith made a big mistake. He he uh, he called the play my way. Watch out, Dave is there. <laughs> <laughs> either, either, either he was slow and he thought he was, or I was faster than he thought I was. And anyway, he made the play. So it was a big play in that in that that time. And then the you know our in our last year, the sixty seven, the last championship, I had a big I had a big block punt in the about block field goal that, that that set the thing up, turned the whole game around against Detroit. You know, every game was big. The big had a lot of big plays, and I, I thought about them all. You know, and uh, but each year, each year the the one is that seemed to me to be bigger than the one the year before. Mm-hmm. The thing is, you, you can't live with just one big play in your career. Well, you you can't gotta have a number. <laughs> was that live with one? Oh, I'll tell you, one one game, one one of the big one of the big games I, I remember was a of all things was a preseason game. In Miami, in the Heat, the last preseason game, the last game before the the undefeated season, and Marvin and I, and the, 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 the last exhibition game, and Marvin and I were going head to head. It was like eighty degrees there, and we we're beating each other to death, man. And, and I never forget Zonka came one by. I said, "What are you guys doing? You're gonna kill each other out here." And I, I said, "I said, get that in, bring you in the ball, you come in here and see what happens." He said, "No, I'm not about it." He said, "You guys go do what you want to do." But that was a. Uh, By the way, we won that game too. The, that was the last game that the, the Dolphins lost that season. They went undefeated after that, seventeen to zero. I'd like to think that that we got them ready for that for that undefeated season. I know one thing: when he walked off the field, Marv was ready. He told me so. <laughs> he said, "I'm ready." He made the play some more. We had a good time. We had a great time. But it was hot as heck. Robbie, my biggest uh, play that I think of is—I mm-hmm. know I made some, but this is stands above them all. We're um, getting ready to go to. We're in Buffalo, and we we had we're losing by I, don't know, I forget how many points, but we had to score to win. And when I <clears throat> I caught the ball about the thirty yard line, about eight guys hit me, and mm. I took about four to the goal line. Oh yes, but that, that's not the story. The story is, after everybody came over and jumped on me, you suffer, go and beat me, kick me, kiss me, hug me, beat me, jump, we love you, you know? And right in front of me, right in front of me, in, my, in my, front of my eyes, I didn't know what it was. So after everybody gets up, 
a ten dollar bill. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I ran up and down the sideline. Look, 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 I found the dollar bill. Yeah. Oh, that, was, that was a game salary, wasn't it? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I tell you it's it's amazing. It, it, you know, I, I tell I tell people all the time, like I said, I, I negotiated with Vince myself one on one and we went back to back about the salary. Vince is always tell us that no matter what you do. You never discuss your salary with anybody else. The most private thing you got is your salary. Don't discuss it with anybody else. And I said, Coach, don't worry about me. I'm just as ashamed of that salary as you are. <laughs> 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 but uh, but, it, but we didn't ever, I never thought about the money on the field. On the field, when it came down, you looked up and seen somebody like run, running back coming at you. You know, like like I, like I said once before, I had to attack John <laughs> Mackey, get through past John Mackey, just to meet Jim Parker leading Lenny Moore, and you said, am I getting paid enough to make the tackle? The answer would be no, no, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to go on, but you make the tackle, and, you, and that's it, because you just did it, because money never enters into it. And we didn't have injury timeouts. So, <clears throat> I'll share very briefly with uh, your, your A high point you know, in, in my career. I've been starting you know, off and on when they brought me in as – you're a youngster like you're there and then, I don't know, 69 or whatever. <coughs> Shula gave me the starting job. Ted Hendricks was the kid. He had just come out. <coughs> he started Ted on the right and he moved Mike Curtis from outside into the middle. You're there. Thursday, I'm starting. I mean, I'm the full time starter now. Thursday, I sprained my ankle both ways, inside and outside. Mm. I couldn't stand on it. Mm. I couldn't walk on it. And as Dave was sort of saying, like you know, early, early, man, I went to the you know the old black folks, you know, remedy with a torn up paper bag with vinegar, soaked in vinegar, and packed it around your leg and ice and heat, ice and make your heat. And when I got to reach the stadium. The morning of the game, we were playing Sonny and the Redskins. And, and, and Sonny was one of the best throwing quarterbacks that you know when you play a game. He would kill you. He just didn't have the greatest line at that time. But I, could, I couldn't even put weight on the leg to uh, get to the locker room there. Friday. So I got in, I'm sitting in front of my locker room, and Shula came by, and he's like, you're looking at me. You know, you know little guy. He's looking at me and he says, uh, what are you going to do? You going to play? And I thought, oh, man, I, I, I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. I went out. I played. I intercepted Sonny twice. Mm. And I was NFL player of the week. Like you're there. Um, Dave will, can elaborate like you know more. There was no such thing as quit. I mean, people can talk about injuries and I ran 10 yards, take me off the field. Like a, that's not the way that it was back during the time that we played, Dave. And you know, if you will take that like you're over. If, they always said, if you can stand up, you can walk. If you can walk, you can run. If you can run, you can play. You play, that's it. Hey, 81. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, you three could keep on talking all night. <laughs> I got jackets to sell. You got it. <laughs> I got jackets to sell, man. So I need to hear from Craig. Okay. I'm going to get out of Craig's way here so that he can get in here. And... Man, Dave. Our fans. 80, 81 dropping the ball. He just fumbled. <laughs> I know. Huh? He fumbled. I know. It's not all about Craig. Hey, yeah. hey, everybody. Hey, hey. He has good hands, though. This is Craig. My name is Craig Gibson. I'm from Jay's Design. As also, I represent the Players Congress. And uh, today, I just want to show—I just want to showcase just a tidbit of what we really do. And you guys can just feel free to visit the website after this and 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 see the whole line. I mean, there's good stuff on there. So today, like I said, I just want to showcase what we have here. And this is one of our high-end jackets right here. This is an all-leather exclusive signature series. And we make this jacket right here, signature with Ford. 
Dave Robinson, as well as Mr. Mar Fleming. So check this out. You get an autographed copy here, satin lining, all leather jacket. And these jackets are custom. So when we say custom, we're talking about, hey, like we we chop the arms, we, we cut it off to hide, and we, we uh, cut the logos out, and, and the jacket comes together, and you have a custom jacket. You can get this jacket any size, from small to 6X, whatever. We can make it for you. Also, Wait, tell, them, tell them, that's not a facsimile. That's a real autograph. That's so a real autograph. Oh, every, oh, look, everything we do is authentic, 100%. We don't touch it if it's not. So, I mean, this is coming from Mr. Robinson himself. So if you want to represent a Dave Robinson, Mar Fleming jacket, Look at that autograph. Well, now even I even ran Bob through the, the gauntlet and said, what's going to keep that signature from fading or bleeding? And he assured me that you guys put a sealant on there, that that signature is going to last forever. That signature is going to be there. We do spray the jackets before, we, before they even get released. We make sure it's sprayed. Uh, you guys are going to be able to wear this jacket. You're going to be able to show this jacket off. And, and uh, man, enjoy it's yourself. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, we also have a commemorative jacket. Then this jacket commemor commemorates every Super Bowl that the Packers have ever won. That's gorgeous. Every single logo. Look at the embroidery work. I mean, beautiful. Four-time Super Bowl champs. This jacket is also reversed. Your, cam your camera got messed up a little bit there. <laughs> there you go. Coming back. Right. Coming back to you. Okay, this jacket is reversible. Logo on the inside if you just want to wear it on your plane days. But if you want to truly represent, you have your business side. This jacket represents Green Bay to the fullest. I don't know how any true fan wouldn't want that jacket right there. Come on now. Talk to me. Okay. Here. This jacket is a poly jacket. This is one of the top sellers right now. This is one of our, uh, I'd say, better price-based jackets right here. Here it is. This jacket is not a reversible, but you have a full poly. You have embroidered logos everywhere. Mm. This is one of our introductory price jackets. Has a year. Packers logo. Packers logo front and back. And this jacket right here. Everyone. This jacket, as you've seen Mark Fleming wearing, Beautiful. You have your zigzag jersey stitch. Original Packer logo. True green. And this is just like our most introductory jacket that we have. Please. What what'd you call that about. jacket, Dave? You call that the economy friendly jacket? This is super economy yeah. friendly. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And I'm so, telling you, I, I got mine, and I, I absolutely love mine. Mine's a reversible one as well, mm -hmm. and uh, it's incredible. These jackets are high, high quality. Yes, sir. High yes. quality. Yes, they are. So this jacket, you guys, go on the website. Like, if you guys want to represent today, this jacket can get shipped out to you, and you can make Christmas. This is, this is like the perfect Christmas gift for any Packer fan. Go to the website, playerscongress.com. Get this jacket we have right now in stock available ready to ship medium to 2x and we and we're going to talk about it more in a minute here but we're also giving a group discount for our group isn't that yeah. correct and i believe the code at checkout is r p c 18 yes and i believe marvin and dave <laughs> bob did that just for our group which is incredible i believe it's 10 percent discount 10% discount. It's incredible. If buy, and if you buy two jackets, hey, you get free shipping. So, free shipping, you buy two. Yeah, so right now, like I say, go get this jacket, please. Represent Packer Nation. Okay. You guys, all you cheeseheads out there, oh, Dave and Marv, you know, uh, at least to go look at the website. Go check it out. Take a look because these jackets, I'm telling you, are high quality. And you want to talk about the perfect Christmas gift for any fan. Like, like I said earlier, yes, we got Packers, but for your family members that are Cowboys, that are Steelers, anything out there, you know, they need to stay warm too, even though we don't like them. They got to still stay warm, right, Dave? That's right. We might not like them, but you they got to the stay thing. warm. Here's the thing, you know, if, if, 
the whole world with nothing but Packer fans, then all the other teams would fold. Yes. And if other teams fold, we have nobody's butt to kick every Sunday. We well, have like, somebody you know, to pick up. Well, what they're doing by moving these oh. other teams, they, 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 this is protecting my paycheck. Yes, yes. I and mean, we love the sport. So, I mean, you know, a little bit of uh, competition never hurts anyone. So, I also ordered a, a Dodger jacket, and I believe Bob was telling me that Dodger Stadium, 90%, maybe 95% of the jackets at these stadiums are from you guys. Yes, yes. Well, Which we is do, incredible. We sell to all the stadiums. We sell to stores. We, we take care of other websites as well. I mean, but right now we want you guys to go to playerscongress.com. So That's yeah, right. We we'll take care of everyone. We have stores all over the place. But I just want you to know, when you guys come, there's just so much other things that you can buy. Visit the website. Hey. See the jackets that we have on there. And you guys, I mean, you, we, when we say custom jacket, you guys might be able to say, look, I'm a 4X body. But I have short arms. I need 3X arms. And we can pull that off for you guys. So this is a true custom jacket. So get your detailed signature series, Mar Fleming, Dave Jacket, and, and hey, let's go. That is, that is the signature series. Please understand, people, the one with the patches autographed is called the signature series ones. You got to go take a look at them. They are incredible. We, we even carry the bag. Yeah, look, look, everybody has that other person in the house. So, like you say, check the website out, and you better take care of somebody. I mean, look at this. Man, I feel a little nauseous Come right on. now. What about you, Dave? Come on. <laughs> Doesn't look that great. Right. I understand. I understand. Just, I understand just the don't show us no bears one right now. No bears? No. no. no bears. Right. Somebody, right. somebody asked me why the Vikings wear purple, and they told him that – uh. If you choke as much as they do, you'd be purple too. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, we're not referring to this weekend. But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, just, look, please check out our website. Uh, I mean, these guys, I mean, just just to be around this, see these guys here, man, and uh, to see Hall of Famers and, and, and know that this also helps out. Uh, I mean, come on, please go to the website and visit and check out all. It's a blessing. This. It's a blessing, man. It's a Bye. blessing. So please go check out blairscongress.com. Craig, thank you for your time, man. I appreciate you jumping in. I know Mark put you to work last minute kind of thing, but oh, thank yeah. you for jumping on and helping us out a little bit tonight. Uh, no problem, and I appreciate you. Thanks, Packer Nation. All right, man. All right, where's where's the old guys at? <laughs> not not I'm me the, and I'm you, the right, Dave? The not me and you, right? I'm I'm the oldest. Oh, you know, Mark, Mark was a my Mark came to Green Bay. He's only 20 years old. <laughs> they talk about and and uh, uh, they talk about guys now 20 years old, but now they're coming out of college and just juniors. They should be 20 years old. Mark went through four years of college and came out came to Green Bay back as, as 20. Although, although Marvin did make a mistake, there wasn't two leagues that were drafted us. We guys had three because the Canadian Football League drafted us also. In fact, to force the NFL to hold their draft in December because uh, what they do, you know, they drafted at the Canadian League was over in November. And they'd hold a December draft. And then when they when got around April and Green Bay and the NFL would draft, NFL, AFL, they would tell, you, they'd tell the players that, well, we already signed now because you're not going to be drafted in the NFL. And uh, they lost a lot of ball players that way. So they dra- I got drafted on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. Where'd Marv go? Marv take Marv go to the bathroom or something? No, no, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah, I was oh. just talking. Uh, I was so young that um, when I went to Green Bay, 20 years old, and they're having like a uh, party is having. Hey, Marv, we lost you. Yeah, the party is having a um, having a roll call. They only says, "Star here, Misty here, um, Davis here, Fleming." I said, "Here." Uh-huh. He says, "By the way, Fleming, stay out of the team joints." <laughs> I said, but coach, um, I'm, I'm not 21 yet. I can't go into the big bars. He says, stay home. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I mean, uh, but I had a good time. When I was, when I was um, do you remember when I got uh, the initiation and, and I had to go to the hospital? Um, do you, do you, oh, no, no. Okay. I remember. Yes. Uh, um, I thought you went to the hospital because I hit you too hard. 
no, no. no. I, I'm going to a Mormon school and growing up with no drinking and all that stuff. So I. Wait, um, wait what, what school is that? And where is it at? Uh, it's in Salt Lake City, Utah. Yeah. Oh, Utah. That's okay. Where okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, anyway, um, all my friends didn't drink, so I didn't drink either. But when I, they took me out and got me drunk. I got, uh, I had to go to the hospital. I was there for like three days. And Lombardi was pissed, you know, because I couldn't handle it. But uh, um, it, it worked out. It worked out me, me, by me not uh, being a drinker. I, I still don't drink, thank God. Yeah. Well, I went to a party in school, Penn State. And when I got there, Vince told me, uh, you know, be careful how much you drink. So I stopped drinking for a week. And I went to the hospital for three days. <laughs> I was having a draw. Oh, that's a lie. I didn't. I don't. I don't drink that much anymore. Oh. I don't drink much at all. Well, at, but, Baltimore, at Baltimore, they, they they just pull the beer trucks up in to the stadium <clears> every <throat> afternoon, and you just load it up on as much beer as you want. Rolling Rock, Iron City. Yeah. We had a little brewery on the Beltway, didn't you? Yeah, sure did. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Schaefer. Schaefer, I think it was. No one said, oh, good. I know they made Coke 45 down there. I didn't drink it now, but they made it. There. <laughs> I know they made Coke 45. What it was? What was that Coke 45? And he came out a little brew in the Beltway. Well, okay, um, Robbie. I think um, the people out there in Packer Nation know what they they can help us out with. So yeah. I want to I want to hit you guys with three simple little questions. Okay. These are what the fans ask. If we still got a couple more minutes, right? And then well, just, just a couple. I got a plane. I'm going to. I'm going to Biafra. Oh, look at this. <laughs> you see him? You see him, Dave? You see what he's doing to us already? I know. Okay, go ahead. All right. I know Marvin for for 55 years, so nothing does surprise me anymore. <laughs> 56 years coming to him. 56. <laughs> I, I asked some of the group members, and I came up with three of the best ones right here, and you guys have kind of mentioned it a little bit, but one of my favorite people in the world, Millie D. Jesus, asked, what advice would you give to our rookie players this year? What would I tell them? Would I tell them? What would you tell them, dude? Hey, I'd tell them, listen, you're here, it's a game. you got to enjoy the game. Don't think about the money. Think about how you can – Play the game, enjoy the game, play with all the intensity you can. Play, play your heart out, and then play like play like every play is is going to be a game winner. And, and it's up to you to make the play to save the team and win and win the victory. And it, it's, it's you just got to play all out. Don't you, take any time off. Just play. You know, I I remember one thing that Vince Sabardi said, and Bart Starr quotes it quite a bit. I remember Vince told us one time. He says, "Gentlemen, this Sunday I want you all to be perfect." Perfect. He said, now you understand that only one man was ever perfect, and they crucified him. Mm -hmm. But on your way to perfection, you got to pass excellence. And I will not accept anything less than excellence out of this whole ball club today. And, that, and so remember that. Everything, you can't be perfect, but you can be excellent. Every play, every game. And then that, this, and that, walk up, so you walk up the field and you say, hey, I played one hell of a game today. Win, lose, or draw. And most of the time it will be a win. Do you believe these uh, defensive players are playing a little soft off the line? I think Bob was talking to me about that the other day. I thought we took talking about tackling. I, you know, we were taught we were taught that you had to bring in, you put your show, your head on the film, on the ball, and you hit him at the waist. I mean, you hit him at the waist, you move the center of gravity. The guy goes down. Nobody, nobody yards after contact was a non-entity to Vince the body. Like I said, Vince Lombardi told us that the most a man can gain after contact is two yards, mm. if he's six feet tall, because that's two yards when he falls down. That's it. No, nothing that hit – that the yards after contact is the non, non-existent thing for Vince Lombardi to coach people. And I, and I think it, they need to go back and re-coach tackling. The tackling in the National Football League is atrocious. Even the NFL came with this new, with this new concept, heads-up tackling but they tell you to put your head right where my hand is on the shoulder. And look how close the head and helmet, your helmet and his helmet are. You're inviting the helmet to come in contact. Get the head down there on the ball. Put your helmet on the ball and your, sh and your shoulders in the guy's midsection. 
and, and, you, and you move his center of gravity, he's got to go down. I think we found our new head coach of the Green Bay Packers right there. <laughs> huh? That's a, that's a tough job. <laughs> I'd say it. Yeah. All right. Huh? Now, Jim, this is. Jim, I have one piece of advice for okay. you guys who are coming in. I would encourage all of them to remember that all of America is watching them, all of the world is watching them, <clears throat> all of our kids are watching them. Mm, I love that. With that comes great responsibility. Being a buffoon is not attractive. Being a clown is not attractive. What is attractive is being a good human being and role model to all of the people who are fans, whether you're a Green Bay Packer, uh, a Colt, a 49er, or whatever. If they can do like that, the game will like you'll prosper and they will be happier people during their playing careers and afterwards. Amen to that. I, I would say that um, um, a rookie coming into the league, the average player plays how long? About three years, three and a half years? Three and a half now, yeah. It, it's, not, it's not that much out through the through the this anymore. It's actually, if you remove the top 15% of guys like you who played over 10 years, it's only one and a half years. Wow, okay. Well, if you only played, if you go into it and play every year like it's going to be your last year and save your money, <laughs> don't live large. I know it's, it's so hard to get that money in your hand. <laughs> I remember my side of the story. My first check. My first check, I wanted to buy a stereo, you know, with a speaker, a speaker over there and a speaker over there, you know. And then I went to I, I went to the um, 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 I went to the bank. And I got my first check. I went to the bank and I get, gave the lady, you know, the check. And she's gonna, you know, she says, "How do you want it?" I said, "You know, she first she said sign it." So I, I sign it. She says, "How do you want it?" I said, "Excuse me." What denomination? I said, I'm Baptist. What are you talking about? <laughs> she said, no, 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 no. Hundreds or whatever. So I said, oh, oh hundreds. Uh -huh. So I had like $3,000 with the $100 bills, okay? And I walked around downtown Green Bay. And that want, that want that I wanted, I wanted that stereo so bad that once I crossed that threshold at the store, I didn't want it anymore. I think I didn't want it because I could afford it. So, as you probably know, I took my money back and I, I checked out about $20 and I was happy. And that's how it's been, Mr. Robinson. I'm going to be like Paul Harvey tell you the rest of the story. He took that 20 and got a change in the $1 bills and took the one $1 bill back to his house which is they proudly displayed on his wall now as the first dollar he made in the National Football League. Yeah. yeah. He still has that very first dollar. Uh, <laughs> uh, have a line, more? Yeah, you're on, I'm on the mark. <laughs> Mr. Flemmy, I'm going to ask you one here. A great friend of mine, James Randolph, asked, what TVs and movies have you been in? Oh, TVs and movies. We hear you're a Hollywood star. No, 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 no. I, I did uh, a couple movies. Uh, my biggest movie I had when I had a role is years ago, Heaven Can Wait. I did that. That, that was uh, my biggest movie. But I did a lot of episodes and a lot of commercials and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Dave, Bob, have you yeah. guys done any? I did a few commercials. Thank you. Over the you know, years, did some stuff for Sports Illustrated, did some stuff for Jason, Jason Sanborn Coffee. And I've done some things for some smaller companies in Hawaii. Okay. I, I was on a TV show myself called America's Most Wanted. <laughs> <laughs> They're still looking for you. <laughs> no, but, uh, <clears throat> no I, uh, I, used to, I used to host Packer Rama in Green Bay and some other stuff. Everybody did a little bit of shows. I, I was involved in a couple of TV shows, small ones. Nothing major, only on local network, not on the national networks like, like Marvin was. Not a, 
David, remember earlier in the in the program I said I was fortunate? Yes, Z. You don't probably you don't remember when I was Bachelor of the Year in Ebony magazine, did you? When you were what? Bachelor Ebony magazine. I read about I heard about that. Bachelor of the Year. Bachelor of the Year? Yeah, Ebony magazine. I think that's the copy I, I burned. <laughs> Hold on. Let me grab it. I, I, remember, I do remember. Marv, I remember. I, which, which, I which, thought you were going to mention it. I just, I just could not know what to say. I remember that, yes. Which, mean, which means nothing when you're playing golf, okay? So, anyway. Hey, we want to thank uh, Jim. Thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I want to I want to say one more time before we go that, guys, use that code. Use that code. Go to the website, okay? Go to the website. Don't make me look bad, guys. I told Dave and these guys, you guys are going to buy some jackets in the next yeah. few days, okay? So I know you got birthdays coming up. You got the holidays, special occasions. Support these retired players, these pioneers. Help them maintain their own independence and dignity by purchasing one of these uh, JH design jackets, guys. Yeah, I've signed a lot of those. I signed a lot of those sheets, those little things, the inserts for the jackets. I want to go back and sign some more. That means I got to sell out all they got. So there you go. You know, what is Dave? Robinson? He just showed the Mar Plan. There's Dave Robinson sends your jacket too. I know. Absolutely. I and, and that, that code again is RPC eighteen. And on the signature jackets, being a collector myself. Uh, <clears throat> Rare coins, postcards, and straight razors. I've been a collector. <laughs> I've been a collector all my life. I also collect the Yobui knives. These jackets are going to the <clears throat> signature jackets, and Marv uh, is the director for that program. These jackets are going to do nothing but go up in value over the years. They will appreciate what you pay for them. Today, you take like your good care of it. You probably could make a better investment. Like I think being a collector, I believe that you're that. I, over in our office, we're in the conference room here in our office here, like you're right now. I've got a couple of like your jackets that sold some years back, a few years like your back for probably $300 they're worth uh, in excess of $15,000 right now. Mm. And we have never before, nor has anyone <clears throat> offered a signature jacket that is actually signed by a living player. Catch them while they're still here, boys. We, you know, we just lost <laughs> Isaiah Robertson, who was, one, who was one of our guys the other yeah. night. Isaiah was Supposed to be here Friday morning for a meeting. He went to speak to some kids, I think, on Thursday night outside of Lake Yo, Texas. Killed in an automobile Lake Yo accident. Did not make it Lake Yo back here. Oh, man. But he did good work for us before he did leave here, and he was like you're a good man. So I just say that you're kidding. You're around. You, you really have to realize if you're a collector, sometimes you just have to be kind of mercenary. You know, Dave looks real good. Marv looks like you're real good. But their signature is going to be worth a lot more next year and the next year and the next year than it is like you now. <clears throat> you know, let me say something about signature. When I was a rookie, um, what's our mill linebacker? Ray Nishi. Ray Nishi. Ray. I had a great game, a great uh, – I had a great um, – rookie game and i'm getting we're leaving the shower i mean not shower locker room going to the bus so i started to sign autographs i was big time i started scribbling scribbling you know i just 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 sign all over the place and so um ray says hey Flemmy, get over here I said, oh no what do i do now you know, one of the rookies so he says what is this i said it's my autograph he says sign it so they'll know who you are tomorrow. Mm. You're no Picasso. <laughs> and from then on, I try to really do it. And everybody knows the name. And the, the longer you play, the, the, the more people know your name and the more your pictures and your autographs and everything will sell. So, oh, Lawson again?
No, we're here. Are you there? <laughs> hey, oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, so, also, if you enjoy listening to the conversations of Bob, <laughs> Marv, and Dave, you know, as they've reflected on their careers, you know, they are available for motivational speaking engagements, golf outing. Uh, Marv plays golf all the time. Corporate engagements. You know, do yourself a favor and uh, treat yourself and your guests to a truly, you know, memorable and historic visit with these NFL legends. You know, it will be, I promise you this, unforgettable experience that you guys will cherish forever. Am I right in saying that? You're right. You and you'll be able to read the autographs. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be giving away, uh, you know, on my end here, we're going to be giving away one of these jackets to the members of our group. We're going to pick somebody out and we're going to provide one of these jackets on me to one of these members. And so I want to thank you guys, you know, for, you know, doing this with me. We've been talking about it for days. You know, I don't know. I got to tell you one thing for sure is that you old timers need to learn how to work a computer. How many conversations do you have after this? <laughs> oh my goodness phone boots phone, phone, phone boots <laughs> comfortable with telephone boots when's the last time you saw a phone boot i haven't seen one in years man. <laughs> i tell you don't see them anymore uh, marv did we do that, good that did we do oh, good yeah. marv we did good bob you happy absolutely that's what i care about dave you good yes all right I Anytime I get a chance to talk to people like Bob, Bob Grant, and and Mar Fleming, I'm and, and yourself, talk, I am happy. All right, I'm happy. Well, then, guys, uh, if it, if we're done, call it. And what we say around here is, when we end anything in my group, we always say it loud and we say it proud by just simply saying, "Go pack, go." Go pack, go. Go pack, go. Count me in. Go. Count me in. Go pack. <laughs> All right. Well, then you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, and I'll be speaking with you fellas soon. Thank you. Okay, Jim. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. All right. Nice, nice.